Guys, we need to talk. We need to talk about Sadaharu O. Oh. Yeah, I know that I've talked about him before, but this is a topic that is actually relevant today. As all of you know, a few months ago, Major League Baseball decided to count all Negro League statistics as Major League statistics, which thereby completely changed the statistical landscape of the sport's history. Well, the natural question is why we don't treat other players who were barred from entering the United States and playing Major League Baseball for chiefly racial reasons similarly. The thing that surprises me the most about this topic is how passionately people feel about the subject. And honestly, I think that Sadahara O oh is probably the reason why so many baseball fans get so upset when you talk about comparing Japanese baseball players to American players. The real interesting thing is that you can sort of track O's career through American newspapers. For example, this 1964 Associated Press article points out similarities between his batting stance and Mel Lott's. When you look at them, the similarities between the two are actually obvious. You know, I don't remember seeing any of those hitting gurus on Twitter talking about lifting your front foot as part of your swing. And, I mean, maybe they should pay more attention to this. Of course, the controversy started when O came close to sacred American home run records. It started in October 1976 when O hit home runs 713, 714, and 715. In August 1977, O hit his 756th, passing Hank Aaron on the worldwide list. That attracted considerable media attention in the United States. It also attracted a lot of controversy. As far as I understand, there are two major arguments against O's record being meaningful. The first one is that it's somehow easier to hit home runs in Japan than in the United States. Now, this argument usually consists of some claim that the fences in Japan were much closer in, and there's this assumption that any old fool could have hit 868 home runs if they played out there. I found articles as far back as 1963 claiming that the level of Japanese baseball was on par with AAA. Now, I could buy this argument if we had evidence of marginal Western players going to Japan and dominating, but the reality is a little bit more complicated than that. Let's look at George Altman. He was a contemporary of Sadaharu O, oh, and he was a washed up major leaguer who found new success in Japan. George's career was really coming to a halt when he went to Japan, and then he suddenly started hitting 30 home runs a year. But the problem is that not every player who went to Japan saw that level of success. Johnny Warehouse, for example, signed with the Tayo Wales in 1971 at age 32, theoretically at the end of his prime. His offensive statistics suffered greatly in Japan, only to rebound when he was traded back to Hawaii in 1972. So on one extreme you have Tuffy Rhodes, who suddenly turned into a star slugger when he went to Japan in 1996. His career there looks something like Barry Bonds. Rhodes famously hit 55 home runs in 2001, tying O's all-time single-season record. But then again, Rhodes did have some power in the United States. Well, signs of it anyway. I mean, he hit three home runs for the Cubs on opening day in 1994. Might be just what the doctor ordered. And there's a drive. Way back. Oh, my goodness. Road three home runs. 
On the other extreme is Gary Thomason, who was signed by the Yomiuri Giants in 1981 as a replacement for Sadaharu O. Oh. Thomason was 29 at the time, in his prime. Gary had a record-breaking year in 1981, setting the record for most strikeouts in a single season in Japan. Turns out the Japanese pitching might not be all that easy to hit. Thomason famously had an abstract art form named after him. This was in honor of his futility as a hitter. Well, in my mind, all of this arguing about Japan being a real easy place for home run hitters is invalidated by simply looking at the all-time NPB home run totals. Well, here's the top 20. The only non-Japanese name here is Tuffy Rhodes. And notice that O's lead over Katsuya Nomura, his contemporary and his closest rival, is over 200 home runs. This despite the fact that Nomura played for five more seasons. Yeah, do you see what I mean? We can argue all night long that it's easier to hit home runs there, but nobody's done it. I mean, nobody has done it the way that Sadaharu O did. Nobody's even come close. As sacrilegious as it may seem, the truth is that O dominated Japanese baseball the way that Ruth dominated American baseball. And that really should be worth something. Now, the second argument is that O's record is not meaningful because he never faced major league pitching and he simply would not have done well against major leaguers. This is actually demonstrably false. Here is O's record in numerous exhibition games against major leaguers. He had a whopping 25 home runs and only 338 at-bats, or 426 plate appearances if you include his numerous walks. In 1966, the Los Angeles Dodgers had a postseason tour of Japan. They won most of their games, but only beat the Yomiuri Giants three times out of seven, losing that series. Sadaharu O oh hit a massive grand slam off of Joe Mueller in the first inning of the final game. In spring 1970, the San Francisco Giants visited Japan and played one game against the Yomiuri Giants. O oh went three for three in that game, hitting two home runs, including the game winner in the bottom of the 11th. O oh, hit another grand slam against the New York Mets in their postseason tour of Japan in 1974. Yeah, I know that these were exhibition games, but you have to remember that we use things like exhibition game records to estimate what Satchel Paige or Josh Gibson might have done had there been no color line. We also tend to forget that there were American pitchers in Japan at that time. Joe Stanka pitched five and a third innings for the White Sox in 1959 at age 27 and did fairly well for his only major league appearance. He wound up a star pitcher in Japan in the early 1960s, most notably going 26-7 and seven in 1964 with a 2.40 ERA. Notice though that Stanka didn't simply dominate the league. This is a hint that American pitching might not have been so obviously superior. But, on the other hand, Gene Back was a failed minor league pitcher when the Hanshin Tigers signed him in 1962. He wound up going 29-9 for Hanshin in 1964 and was dominant until age 31. And that's really the biggest point that I want to make. You know, the more that I look into this, the more that I realize that statistics don't really transfer over cleanly from one country to the next, or if you look into minor league baseball from certain minor leagues to the majors. I mean, in this case, some Americans adapted really well to playing in Japan and some didn't really do that well. The same actually has been true of Japanese players going to the United States to play. Not everybody's Ichiro. Some players have done well and some players have done really poorly. But I still wanted to see how O oh would have done if he had played in the United States. And so I did what I think all of us would do. I stuck him into OTP in the United States starting in 1959, his rookie year, just to see what would happen. Now, you can't have an OTP save without describing how things are set up. This time I gave career mode a shot. I turned the minor leagues off, giving each team a 10-player reserve roster instead. I also decided to use the development engine exclusively. The idea was to see how O would develop. I also went for a radical and somewhat aggressive revenue sharing system. This was in hopes of preventing teams like the Yankees from winning every year. This included having the visiting team share 50% of the home team's gay revenue. Yeah, we'll take a closer look at what those settings actually do in a later video. For now though, we'll just focus on what happened to Sadaharu O. Oh. When you import O, oh, you run into a problem. His ratings are awful. You can see it in the editor screen. For some reason, OTP assumes that he will play the way he played at age 19 forever and that he will never develop. 
Now, I don't know why this is. My guess is that for some stupid reason, OTP just didn't piece his overall career statistics together. Now, we have seen problems like this in past editions of OTP, especially when dealing with famous black players like Josh Gibson. The problem that we have really is that OTP's database is closed source. It wasn't always closed source, but it has been for the last decade or so. The engine also, of course, is closed source, so we can't dive in and take a look and see what's happening or what assumptions are being made. I think that OOTP assumes that these Japanese statistics were played at like single A level or something like that, but I don't know. Anyway, I made a couple of fixes to his potential using Jim Albright's research on O as a guide. I buffed him up a little bit from Albright's projections. I figure that his potential represents the height of his ability, not his average performance. His profile in 1959 looked like this. Not a world beater, but a kid with maybe some talent. And that is where the problems become clear. I just simply couldn't get the computer to play with him. O was traded to the Cubs in mid-1960, where he continued to sit on the bench. Meanwhile, O's potential ratings had slipped. I went in to try to buff him up again. However, he remained a marginal player for the Cubs for years, a pinch hitter who never got the chance to start. O was a first baseman, and he found himself behind Joe Pepitone, who, was, who the Cubs decided to go out and get despite having O on the roster. Here's O's profile for some contrast. I went through a few more seasons of this sim before finally concluding that something was wrong. I thought the problem might have been O's defensive ratings, which were anything but good. So I decided to start over and to try again, but this time I would improve O's defense as well as his offense. I went a little bit overboard with both his potential and defensive ratings. This is what it looked like on the editor screen. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how I'm supposed to change his speed ratings. Maybe that's in his bio section? One thing that I do know for sure though is that I absolutely hate how OOTP's player editor works. O was still a bench player his first season, but showed clear signs of potential. He was traded to Baltimore right before the 1961 season, where he continued to linger on the bench. Here's one of his few at-bats during his three seasons with the Orioles. He could hit for power, but he still wasn't starting. Thirty-two-year-old Bob Skinner stood in his way. Notice, by the way, that O's potential had decreased as he continued to sit on the bench. I think that that's because of OTP's development system, though I'm really not sure. Again, it would be really nice to have some clarity on how the system actually works. Otherwise, I can only guess as to why the computer decided to leave him on the bench for so many years. O signed with the Twins for 1964, but he still didn't start. He wound up with the Mets in 1965, and his potential took yet another hit. I get this weird feeling that there's something programmed in the game that automatically brings the potential of certain players down no matter what happens. I mean, 24 years old is still young. His potential ability shouldn't be tanking like this. However, there was no way O was getting any playing time at first base, not with Willie McCovey in front of him. By 1966, he was with the Astros, where his potential continued to fall. He then signed with the Orioles in 1967. I decided to buff him up once more, increasing both his current and potential ability. I guess it's cheating, but seriously, I just wanted to see him play for a change. My work was rewarded with a season-ending injury in spring training. O wound up with Cleveland in 1968. He then went back to Houston in 1969, once again as a free agent. Well, I think that the OTP general managers were worried about signing him to anything more than a one-year contract at this point. I mean, he had never been a regular starter, and he had never really done anything despite showing clear ability. It was pretty interesting to watch. This version of Sadaharu O apparently came with a bit of a temper. He was suspended for three games in spring training 1970 after throwing a fit over a called strike. He did figure out a way to hit in the Astrodome, however. This is from his 1971 season. By 1973, injuries started to catch up with him. He missed the beginning of the season with a herniated disc. He then sprained his ankle in late August, setting him out for the rest of the season. The Astros were horrible that season. I don't think he could have done much to help them. 
And then, in mid-December, O was the victim of one of those classic OTP injuries, being nearly killed when that tractor fell on top of him. Of course, nobody dies in OTP, but it did end his career prematurely. My Sadaharu O experiment came to an end. He managed only 147 home runs despite my best efforts to buff his stats. Yeah, this project was a bit of a disappointment. This is probably the first OTP project that I've really been frustrated with. I do wonder though how many real life baseball players with strong potential wound up languishing on the bench or somewhere in the low minors. Anyway, it was frustrating to see O not play and then get injured horribly when he did play. But then again, it wasn't necessarily unrealistic. Let me know what you think. Let me uh, leave me a, a note down below.